Hello everyone. Welcome back to Fundamentals of Nano and Quantum Photonics. So in the last lecture, we looked at uh, the Lorentz model and how that can be used to uh, explain the optical properties of dielectrics. So and we also said that uh, the Lorentz oscillator can be used to explain even metals because uh, metals essentially are composed of free electrons, right? So we can extend that. So let's say if you say that metals are simply free electron gas, that means omega naught is zero. So omega naught is a natural frequency that we assumed for a Lorentz oscillator. And so in case of free electrons, the metals, are, the electrons are not bound to any nucleus, so omega naught field is going to be zero. Okay. And so here is my Lorentz oscillator term, okay, that I have just taken from the previous lectures. And uh, if you substitute omega naught equal to zero, and let me also just consider that epsilon infinity to be one for now, okay, just for simplicity. In real metals, it's going to be some number that can be, you know, either obtained by fitting the experimental data or by looking at, you know, yeah, some other uh, data sheets, you can get these numbers, okay. So now if you take this scenario, what will happen to my drude lorentz model, okay. By the way, we call it drude lorentz because the behavior of uh, metals was first described by Paul Drude, and uh, we can also use Lorentz model to explain that. So we combine that, we call it drude lorentz model, essentially just to give credit to Paul Drude. Okay. So now, uh, epsilon of omega is going to be one, since omega naught is zero here, uh, there's a negative sign, I'll take it out. So one minus omega p square divided by omega square plus i gamma omega. So I want you to just note this, you know, this is something that uh, we see it often, we should be careful about the sign. So the omega terms are negative, omega naught is positive in the Lorentz model. So when you set that zero in the root model, it becomes minus one minus omega p square by omega square plus i gamma omega. Okay. So now, what does it mean? You know, let's try to separate out into the real and imaginary parts. So we will multiply by omega square minus i gamma omega. If we do that, what we'll end up is simply this one minus, let me, uh, the denominator is going to be, if I'll take out omega square, I'll take out that, so this is going to be omega square plus i gamma omega, uh, is that right? No, I have taken out omega, let me, okay, write it out fully, okay, omega square plus i gamma omega, omega square minus i gamma omega and on the top you have omega p square omega square minus i gamma omega okay so uh, in the denominator it's going to become omega square is going to come out omega square plus gamma square okay in the numerator it's going to be one minus uh, in the real case, okay, we'll put this like this. Okay, we'll separate out the real and imaginary parts. So for that, let's take it out. <coughs> yeah, this is just simple algebra. So what it'll end up is one minus omega p square divided by omega square plus gamma square. This is going to be the real part. And there's going to be an imaginary part, which I can write it as, plus, uh, this is going to be plus, yeah, I omega p square gamma divided by omega into omega square plus gamma square. I think that's what it's going to be, okay? So uh, this is the real and imaginary parts of the optical function, that's it. There's no big uh, difference. So this is my epsilon one of omega and this is my epsilon two, the absorption part. Okay, so let's try to understand how this behaves. Okay, this is going to be plus i epsilon two. Okay, so how does this behave functionally? Okay, so let's try to first look at uh, the real part. Okay, and let me plot this on an axis consisting of frequency. So I'll plot it on omega uh, by omega p axis. Okay. So at omega, so if you look at this, 
look at what happens when omega is less when the frequency is less when the frequency is less let's assume that for now the the loss is small so when the frequency is less this denominator is going to be you know small and that's why the negative term will become significant okay so that's why if you plot this function it's going to look like the real part is going to look something like this okay and at what frequency does the the optical the epsilon change from negative to positive that is going to be exactly at uh, omega equal to this is going to be 1 right on other words the omega equal to omega p at the plasma frequency the epsilon value goes from negative into the positive territory okay and as you go to higher and higher frequencies in this case effectively the second term can become very close to zero so you will start saturating at uh, epsilon equal to 1 okay this is my epsilon equal to 1 line okay in this case but if you have any real material uh this is going to be epsilon infinity is a value at which metal more or less becomes flat the real part okay now what happens to the imaginary part the absorption okay so let's look at a case where uh, low frequency at the low frequencies okay so what happens to the imaginary part so if you look at uh at omega equal to much smaller than omega p okay when you go to that regime effectively the denominator is going to be small so the whole loss blows up okay so that's why the the loss function of a drude model goes as like this at low frequencies you have a very large number as the frequency increases the value of loss this is my epsilon 2 of omega and the red one is my epsilon 1 of omega so at low frequencies this term is going to be large okay but as you go to higher and higher frequencies this term does not contribute much okay and what is the reason why this does happen well uh, at low frequencies you have a lot of uh, scattering with the phonons okay there there is collisions and because of that your your uh, loss is high okay so basically the incoming photon collides with an electron and also it loses energy to the the lattice okay electron photon collision uh, collisions so what did i say okay so essentially the photon is transferring its energy to the electron and the electron loses it to the lattice okay and we'll come back and we'll explain a little bit more about how the collisions happen in a subsequent slide but for now at low frequencies there is a large loss okay. now at high frequencies you know what happens let's say at uh, omega is much much greater than gamma and let's say it's comparable to omega p okay so when you go to this regime what will happen so if your omega is large the denominator is going to be large so effectively the imaginary part is not significant right the epsilon 2 of omega is negligible negligible okay so that's why we are representing this as the loss is becoming low in the y axis right and epsilon 2 is small and effectively in a very uh, high frequency regime your epsilon is equal to 1 minus omega p square by omega square and effectively it becomes metal behaves like a dielectric metal behaves like a dielectric at low frequencies what happens the epsilon 1 is negative what does it mean it means that the polarization that we are inducing is actually opposing the incident electric field and that's why we get that uh, epsilon to be negative in the low frequencies all right so this is how the metals will look like the the optical properties of metals typically look like this this is a theory and let's see how that compares with the experiment okay so here is some data that is taken from a couple of papers and you know uh, i think the data is also taken from one uh, photonics db that's a website on and i know how you can find the data so what you see in this case is let's first look at uh, aluminum 
okay or uh, silver silver first the black is silver so you see the experimental data and the model that we have is perfectly fitting this okay this is a nearly perfect uh, match and the loss of the metals if there are three metals here gold silver and aluminum and you see that silver has the lowest loss the first part you know loss silver has lowest loss okay and the next of course among these three okay and the next material in terms of loss is gold the red one okay gold is second au is second right second lowest yeah second lowest loss and of course aluminum has some loss in the uv regime you have uh, in the in the low frequency regime you have some loss okay uh this is the data and also you know this some of these parameters for dude model actually given here this is taken from this book in the bottom so you can actually try to plot out how this model looks like all right and you know in this case if you are seeing here the omega p is my plasma frequency right we refer to it a couple of times in the past so what is the number so typically the plasma frequency turns out to be in the range of about uh, 8 to 9 ev okay that's for most metals aluminum has a much higher plasma frequency how do we know that you know how do we know that this number is accurate so the reason this comes if you look, go back and look at the formula for plasma frequency omega p is basically n e square divided by m epsilon not okay and we said is a density of atoms right when we talked about the polarization we said dipole moment times the density right n is the density here there so in this case if you typically consider metals their density n is going to be of the order of 5 to 6 into 10 power 28 per meter cube okay the atoms per meter cube right in this case electrons finally it will come down to electrons how many electrons you have to look at electrons per atom and so on depending on the electronic structure and typically the n is going to be in this range okay so i would ask you to put these numbers inside you know take you know already the charge of electron you know what is the mass and we know what is the epsilon not of course in this case the mass should be effective mass but for now just take the uh, the mass okay the m not the rest mass you take okay so if you do this you will end up seeing that okay the plasma frequency will be roughly in the range of uh, 5 to 6 ev or 8 to 9 ev whatever in that range okay so this is a number so if you you will have to go back and look at the exact uh, densities and so on so people have done that and they have finally got this numbers of omega p all right and the loss is given in this case okay this is in this table it is shown as capital gamma but in my notation it is small gamma essentially the same thing okay and uh, in terms of ev this is 0.02 and all that second decimal silver has a loss of the lowest loss of about 0.02 ev gold has slightly higher loss and you know aluminum and so on they have higher losses all right but uh, there are some advantages of using you know uh, various materials okay so now uh, if you look uh, i want you to also look at this you know there are two measures of losses that are given the gamma is given in two units one is the ev unit one is the uh, per second unit and essentially gamma represents the scattering rate we call it scattering rate essentially how fast are the electrons colliding with each other okay actually if you think about it we are representing the metal which has 10 power 22 uh, electrons per centimeter cube right a large number of electrons and we are representing that by a free electron as if the electron is actually going freely in that lattice okay the only damping factor we are assuming is a collision with other electrons and it is very surprising that that sort of a simplistic model is actually uh, uh, capturing a lot of these optical parameters if you think about it okay so now uh this collisions you know the 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 rate at which the electrons collide with each other is essentially the one over the time the collision time is essentially you're going to be gamma and that is of the order of you know in this case i think it will be about 10 to 30 femtoseconds is the time tau if i to call it the collision time okay collision time okay is going to be about 10 to 30 fem uh, femtoseconds and so on okay you can just compute back compute from here from the value is given here you can compute that will be the range okay this is an important point because this is going to determine the 
loss of the um, uh, various meta materials we will talk about okay all right the this is about the drude model but if you look at it closely you will see that the model more or less matches for let's say aluminum and uh, silver but when i come to gold i see that the imaginary part is actually strongly deviating after a point okay that is because of a very fundamental thing that happens the the, the way the electronic structure is okay so i have pre previously briefly mentioned uh, the ek relation okay so we said there is this energy versus momentum relation that we can talk of and we said that for a semiconductor uh, or rather for a metal this is going to be a parabola okay my dispersion is going to be a parabola and we know that the electrons are filled up to a certain level which we will call as the fermi energy ef right so now when you shine a photon on this metal what happens well you have lots of electrons up to the fermi level right so let's say there is an electron here and it can make a jump to a higher energy level for example it can go to a higher energy level here okay when it is able to make the transition the photon loses its energy and that is absorbed okay so this will be my the the level to which it jumped right if i think look at that that will be my delta e the energy difference so the photon the delta e is going to be photon energy but in addition you're going to have a delta k the initial uh, momentum of an electron is there the k is essentially proportional to the momentum and the final momentum is there so the difference is delta k okay so in addition to satisfying the energy conservation relation that is essentially saying that if i have a electron of initial energy i ei plus let's say there is the energy of the photon that should be equal to the energy of the final energy of the electron okay that is the energy conservation relation similarly we can talk of the conservation energy for conservation of momentum so h cross k is my momentum h cross k initially plus momentum of a photon plus p of a photon should be equal to h cross k final okay but we all know that momentum actually of, of a photon is very very small so because of that it turns out that this sort of a absorption process wherein we we call this as intra band absorption process okay intra band absorption mean intra band absorption which essentially means that within the band okay intra band within the band so the electron is making a transition this way when you have this sort of a fashion, uh, uh, process you will have strong absorption at small omega right at low frequencies okay but if you increase the frequency it turns out that the delta k cannot be supplied you know the the momentum mismatch right that comes from the phonons and that is not sufficient the lattice vibrations cannot su uh, supply enough momentum to actually make a transition happen at high energies okay so delta k requirement delta k requirement not satisfied at high frequency okay that's why we don't have absorption we already saw that you know we we from the formula we explained why it should be like this absorption should be dropping but yeah this is a inter interesting way of looking at it okay so this is the intra band absorption in addition to this there is something called inter band absorption inter band transition so if you look at the let's say gold au the electronic structure will have something like 5d 10 and 6s the there is this outer shell which is contributing the conduction but also there is a d electrons uh, d shell which is completely filled up which is there at slightly lower energy so if i draw a band for that i would represent that band by drawing something like this okay so it should not be displaced it should be roughly symmetric okay so this is my d shell d band and this is my s band okay that this d band is slightly lower than the fermi level so now when a photon of let's say energy more than in this case of gold about uh, 2.2 ev or so if it hits this it can actually make an electron go from the d band okay in this case i'll show it on this left side uh, let me show it here yeah from the d band sorry it can go up into the empty state here 
okay so into the sorry it cannot there i should not show it there how do i yeah from this case to this case right this is my interband absorption okay so interband absorption means between bands okay so from d it's going to transit into s band and this has a threshold behavior of about 2.4 ev so if the photon energy is greater than 2.4 ev this absorption happens okay and that's why in gold and even in copper you have this interband transitions coming in and that is why you have this uh, absorption increasing and that's why gold and copper you know gold looks a yellowish in color and copper looks kind of greenish yellow okay so this is about uh, how the materials behave the drude model explains all of this okay so these transitions are quite important in terms of uh, uh, of course understanding metals here but later on also we will talk about it that's why i just wanted to introduce the idea of interband intraband okay interband means between two bands intraband means within the same band okay all right so now so what do we do the drude model does not seem to explain the optical properties of uh, gold right so how do we solve this problem okay the way to go about that it's i mean this is a very funny quote and i sort of like it apparently john uh, von neumann who is a father of computer architecture who is considered one of the pioneers right he had a quote he said with four parameters i can fit an elephant and with a fifth one i can make him wiggle his trunk okay so the idea is that if you put enough number of variables in an equation you can fit anything okay so now what happens is in this case we said that we will use a lorentz oscillator right so instead of one lorentz oscillator i'll try to put multiple lorentz oscillators we already introduced that when we talked about the vibration rotational resonances right so instead of this i'll write out the lorentz model in terms of uh, summation in terms of j oh by the way i should call this as fj okay the strength of the oscillator can be different oscillator strength need not be one it can be different oscillators can have different strengths okay so now if i if i do that i can actually try to fit it okay in fact uh, the funniest thing is this is a quote i think he, he it was made way back in 1940s or so for late 50s early 50s or so okay and somebody actually went and then <laughs> showed mathematically there's a paper published in 2010 which actually showed how four parameters or five parameters can Uh, create an elephant in this form and actually you can move the trunk as well if you change one of those parameters so it's a it's a kind of a you know um, quirky kind of a paper yeah it's interesting all right so the exactly same thing we do in this case of uh, gold i think we have taken five oscillators and you can go back and look at this bottom you know the paper in the referred in the bottom here you look at the parameters and you actually put those parameters and you can actually reconstruct the optical properties of gold in a fairly uh, good manner all right so uh this is about the the optical properties of uh, metals all right so in the next lecture i'll actually uh talk about a very fundamental uh, relation that needs to be obeyed okay we'll uh, that's called as kramer's chronic relation we'll talk about it in the next lecture all right so uh thank you so much for your attention uh i'll see you in the next lecture bye